Hi everyone, welcome back. Uh, so today continuing looking at the different libraries I created for the OneBoard project. The one we're going to look at today is the PID control loop class. I know there are a few available, however I like to roll my own wherever possible and also just trying to keep the overheads to a minimum as far as the size of the application is actually concerned. So let's take a look at that one now. Okay, so let's just navigate to the GitHub project. And here we have the project for the PID loop library. And there's a little bit of information there on how to actually use it. What we want to do is grab a zip. There it is there. We'll just move it onto the desktop here and close that. Now, if we just start up the Adreno software, Waiting, waiting, waiting. Bloody hell, this is so slow. Oh, come on. Okay, finally, it's up and running. Okay, so if we go and do sketch, include library, and then add a zip library, I'm going to go to the desktop, and there's our download. So I'll just choose that, and that should now be installed. If we just take a look under examples, here we are, PID loop, and there is an example there. So let's just open that one. So the way the PID loop library is used is pretty straightforward. Uh, first of all, we just need to include it. Uh, then we need to instantiate the actual class. And we're just passing through a value of a thousand in this case and that is basically a thousand milliseconds so this sets the frequency that the calculation is going to occur for working out the output this is a test application we're going to be passing some data backwards and forwards on the serial port just to get a bit of a feel for how it works so i'm beginning the serial and just setting it to 9600 uh, the first thing i'm doing is setting the tuning parameters that's pid and the action and then I'm setting the dead band to zero and I'm setting the output limits to zero and 100 we need to do a reset on the control after we've set the output limits to calculate some internal values so we do that as a starting point I'm just setting the set point to 50 and the process variable to 50 okay so in the loop as I said this is just a test application so there's a little bit of code here around that I'm just monitoring the serial port and if I see a character Q then I'm going to increase the process variable by one and if I see a letter A come through I'm going to decrease the process variable by one and then after that I'm going to print out the set point and why is that like that I'm going to print out the set point and the PV on the serial port. I'm going to call the execute method and then I'm going to print out the output. We've got an Arduino turned on here and the port is set. So let's just upload that code. Let's open the serial monitor. Okay, and now that's finished uploading. As you can see, it's continually streaming out data. Let me just stop that. We've got our set point set at 50, the process variable starting point at 50, and the output is midway between 0 and 100. So at the moment, we have tuning parameters of 2, 0, and 0. So we've got a proportional gain of 2. So what, in effect, we should see, if we increase the error, so the difference between the set point and the process variable, the output should vary in a totally proportional manner. And with a value of 2, if I change it by 1, so if I go send a Q, and our process variable goes up by 1, 
the output actually goes up by two. So if we send if we send another queue, we've got an error of two and we've got an output of four. So that's exactly what I would expect. And if I go back down, exactly the same in the opposite direction. So with an error of two, I have an output difference of four. So that's an example of how the proportional gain can affect the output based on the error between set point and PV. So let's just leave that at two at this point in time. And let's set a value of one in the integral term and we'll upload that. Okay, again, so uh, everything's going and it's in a steady state condition, 50 set point, PV of 50, so there's zero error and the output is just sitting nicely on that 50. So now, the way the integral term works is it will tend to keep varying the output when there is an error trying to bring the loop back into control. So it integrates any error in the actual control loop. So as an example, if we again just send a queue, it will give us an error of one and we should see a proportional action of two be applied straight away. So it goes up to 52, but you'll notice that it's keeping on going up. Now, if I reduce that error by putting the PV equal to the set point, what you'll find is that integral term is still applied to the output. If we increase the error in the opposite direction, you'll notice that it starts coming back down again. So you can see, as long as there is an error, it continually varies the output to try and bring that error back to a value of zero. Here we've got both the proportional action being applied, which is a once only type thing. And we've got integral action being applied, which is that continual varying of the output when there's an error in place. So let's turn off the integral and set a derivative term now and upload that. The derivative term is a little bit different again in that it applies an action to the output based on the rate of change of the error. Again, steady state condition, no error, and the output is just sitting at uh, 50. Now, if we send a Q, that will give us an error of one. So let's do that. And you'll notice that the error went above the proportional component of two for a short period of time and then came back. So you can see that derivative action when there is a change in the error value. It's an instantaneous change when the error changes. However, once we come back to a steady error, then the derivative term returns to zero and all that's left is the proportional action. Okay, so there's an example of the PID parameters being applied. There's plenty of reading on PID loops. Some of them are implemented slightly different. This is pretty much a standard from my time in the control systems industry. However, please do some reading on how the actual loops work. Let's have a look under the cover now at the actual class itself. So again, if we go into the libraries folder for the Adreno and have a look at the PID loop um, folder, again, you'll see there's two classes there. Let me just get rid of this to tidy stuff up a bit. We won't save that. Okay, so let's have a look at the header file for this particular class. Nothing earth shattering here. Here's our class definition, public functions at the top here. We've got a number of internal private variables and we've got the set point, the process variable and the output as properties on the actual class. So let's have a look at the actual code file. So the normal license blurb at the top and then we get into the instantiation of the actual class. So here we're passing through the execution time 
and we're saving that to a local variable, getting the last time processed using millis and just setting some default values for other internal parameters. The next function we come to is the reset. Now the reset is used to, after there's been a change in the control scheme, we can actually reset the integral memory component. We always call that after we set the output limits so that it will set the I memory right in the middle of the actual limits. That way the control act can have the maximum deviation below and above that midpoint. Okay, the next thing is we get to set tuning parameters where the parameters are just passed through and saved to internal variables. Same with dead band and the same with the output limit. The only thing with the output limit is when it is set, if there's been a change or something like that, the I memory gets constrained um, within that range. After doing that, you should always call the reset, but if for some reason you don't, the output will be constrained within those min and max values anyway. Uh, we then have a couple of functions to set manual mode and set auto mode which again are just adjusting internal variables and when it's in auto we actually load whatever the output is being set to at the moment into iMemory so it effectively gives a bumpless transfer between manual to auto. Uh, next we have set manual value so we just pass a value through and it, the output is actually set to that value however it is constrained within output min and max. Next we have the execute method. Here we basically just check to see whether it's time to actually process it just by looking at the loop time minus the last process time. If that's greater than the time to process that we've loaded in, then it will actually calculate the output. So the first thing we do is work out what the error is and we also work out the integral time in relation to the loop duration. The P value is a fairly straightforward calculation. It's the P term times the error. The I value is a combination of the existing I memory plus an integrated amount for the time period between loop processing. And we constrain that between the output min and the output max. So we can't have the I memory effectively going outside of the output min and max and applying a huge integral. The D value is simply the D term times the difference in the error from the last time it processed till now. The I value that was calculated is saved as I memory, the error is saved as last error, and the loop time is saved as the last time it was processed. And then we actually do a check to see whether the loop is in manual. If it is in manual, we don't do anything further because we're specifying the output manually. However, if it's not in manual, then we assume that the loop is in auto and we actually calculate the output. We add the P value, the I value and the D value and we constrain it within the output limits. Okay, now if we've got some dead band applied to the actual output, then we check to see whether it's within the ranges of that dead band. If it is, we set it to zero. If not, we don't do anything. And then we look at the action of the actual control loop. And if it's reverse, we simply uh, times, oh, that's not gonna work. Okay, so after a quick little fix, if we look at the reverse action now, if it is reverse action, then what we need to do is apply the difference between the output and the mid value in the other direction. So that's what we're doing here, calculating the mid value dependent on the output limits and then seeing where the output is in relation to that mid value and then applying it in the opposite direction to the mid value. Okay, so that's the execute method complete. Okay, so that's pretty much that class in a nutshell. Um, feel free to add any comments to the video or c communicate with me on Facebook or email if you'd like any further information. Okay, thanks. Cheers for now. If you like what I'm doing, then please do like the video. If you'd like to see more, then please subscribe and don't forget to hit the chime so you get notified when I post something new.
and I'll put a couple of links here to some other videos you can look at.